preface remarks. And I'm going to begin with my uh, prepared slides here. Um, and uh, this is a little bit of where, where we're going, but um, let's uh, situate us and provide some motivation. So you'll notice I, I've indicated here um, that I'm providing motivations for filtering methods in general. And then we'll, the heart of the talk is really on extended common filtering. Um, the motivations are also in the infectious disease modeling area, but they relate to, to filtering techniques in general. And some weeks ago, in the wake of my introduction to machine learning methods and so on, I, I, I noted that uh, we have two, two spheres of work that are gonna be accompanying us through most of this course. Um, a set of problems having to do with parameter inference uh, of, of deducing, trying to go from data about the world and uh, in some model to understand what are the parameter values probably associated with that model? What is that data from the world telling us about plausible values of these parameters? Because by so doing, we can then, amongst other things, better assess trade-offs between interventions or better know where the system is headed over the coming weeks and months. So this is the problem of static parameter inference. Um, and we began with uh, the most basic approach for pursuing that calibration, where we were trying to find, we we're trying to zero in on, hone in on the single most likely parameter vector, the, the parameter vector that best allowed our model to reproduce patterns in the world. That too is a form of data science, but it's one woven in so centrally to the day-to-day -day workings of, um, of dynamic modeling for infectious disease transmission. We, we almost don't think of it as, as a systems data science technique. It's just a, a system science technique. Um, and indeed it, it can be routinized um, for within certain bounds. It's a learning opportunity, but uh, for example, within our ABM's use for policy guidance um, uh, for COVID-19, they're recalibrated every two weeks or so. It's time to make the donuts every two weeks and, and make the donuts we do. Um, but then we kind of graduated to approximate Bayesian computation where um, rather than trying to arrive at a single best, oops, unique um, parameter vector that best aligns the model with observations from the world, we instead uh, we're, we're trying to sample from a distribution, an approximate posterior distribution, um, where we were sampling different, uh, different parameter vectors. And I noted uh, in response to a student question that it was really important we, we sample not from each parameter in isolation, but from vectors of these parameters together because it may the model may only ma match data from the world empirical time series or particular data points if we have certain combinations of parameter values um, for example maybe it will match if we assume either a high contact rate and low transmission rate per discordant contact or a low contact rate and high transmission rate per discordant contact. And either will explain the data, but you can't have high and high and low and low. No, 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 The data is telling us that only a certain combination, sets of combinations of them will work. And approximate Bayesian computation allowed us to do that. It, it, it allowed us to dismount the high horse of assuming um, a privileged parameter vector and allowed us to recognize uh, that a huge number of different parameter vectors uh, might be possible with different levels of plausibility. And it did so in a particularly simple way. We didn't have to formulate likelihood functions. Um, we could simply accept parameter vectors that 
that yielded model outputs that closely matched observed data where closely was within some epsilon. And then we went to MCMC. Um, earlier this week, we talked about MCMC. And MCMC takes approximate Bayesian computation ideas, but, but really firms them up and makes them more rigorous. Here, we're, we're not merely sampling from the approximate posterior distribution. We're sampling from the honest to goodness um, parameter distribution, posterior parameter distribution. We have the likelihood functions to show for it to boot. And I have some sample code for this, which I was hoping to, to finish for, um, for this lecture today, but um, uh, I, I'm gonna have to roll it out over the weekend um, together with a likely exercise. So here in MCMC, we were also like approximate Bayesian computation sampling from parameter vectors. But we did so in a way that was more finessed and subtle. We, um, instead of just drawing from the posterior distribution and seeing if the model fit within a certain distance, we were exploring space in a more uh, nimble way and in a, in a more finessed way, I should say. Yeah. We, we, we spent more time in areas of space that were more promising, where the model had a better match. Um, and we'd still explore areas of space that had less good matches. We would simply spend less time there. And by so doing, we would be emitting these samples that if we drew a histogram would, hey, there's our posterior distribution. And never do we have to draw out what that posterior distribution is in the algorithm. All we have to do is be able to evaluate at a given point, the value of the posterior. And from that, and we do that with the likelihood function and with the, uh, the, the prior distribution. And we can get this sampling from it. And those techniques have been around for decades. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, the formative work done on MCMC was done in the 1940s as part of the Manhattan Project um, by uh, Nick Metropolis, um, a uh, mathematical statistician of, of, um, of, of great uh, stature. Um, in the uh, uh, in the Manhattan Project context. Um, now, these techniques are all uh, valuable. Um, they all allow us to turn data from the world of observed behavior in the world and and turn it into weave it into gold. Uh, we, uh, take it and, and and emerge from it with an understanding of what is that telling us about parameter values either the single best, as best we could find it, or, or a distribution of possible plausible values, where the distribution allows us to, to talk about outcomes of interventions and compare intervention A against B or some baseline, some status quo against an intervention in a more nuanced way, a probabilistic way. Um, all those are great. And all those are foundational systems data science techniques um, and merit our continued attention. But in so traversing those, we neglected this area over here on the right, which we're gonna be exploring today, this area of latent state inference. And particularly these techniques um, that have become known, um, as filtering techniques. Um, these are techniques which have some stochastic system, which, is, uh, which takes a stochastic system, which is evolving and tries to use models of that system and data about that system or data that's been observed to pinpoint that, to identify that system, to recognize um, what's its current state? What's, what's the current state of things? Um, uh, what's going on out there right now. Um, uh, these techniques uh, are also um, venerable in their, their origins. Coleman filtering in its various uh, subforms, um, including um, its formulation by Strat uh, Ruslan uh, Stratanovich um, in the 1950s, even prior to uh, Rudolf Kalman, um, dates back decades and decades. And common filtering has become 
ubiquitous, uh, as I noted earlier. It's everywhere. Um, it's in uh, plane guidance systems that are used to fly you safely from one city to another, fly you between cities, between continents. It's used in our smartphones and GPS navigation systems. Uh, sadly, it's used in, in missile systems. Uh, but it was also part of the Apollo era spacecraft, the Apollo program spacecraft. The, the, the folks that landed in the moon did so safely in no small part due to Kalman filtering. It uh, was a technique that could be programmed in in a very, uh, uh, in a, in a very compact fashion into those Apollo computers where they had just dozens of, of kilobytes of memory, as I recall, um, and, and uh, forms the basis of very sophisticated uh, feedback systems that are part of um, daily, our daily lives. It's probably in a lot of cars as well these days, um, particularly as autonomous uh, driving comes up or cars are assisted by computers um, more and more centrally. Um, and we're going to be talking about common filtering today, um, and particularly its form for nonlinear systems, extended common filtering. But then we're going to be going on to discuss particle filtering, which takes the basic perspective of common filtering and filtering in general and uh, generalizes it greatly and makes it much more powerful and, frankly, a much better match in terms of the balance of computational efficiency and generality and, um, and uh, sort of confident application um, in nonlinear systems. Particle filtering is a much better match to the needs of mathematical epidemiology and, and uh, infectious disease modeling. And then we're going to graduate on to particle MCMC, where these two strands will join. Um, in particle MCMC, we'll take both perspectives and combine them to involve inference, not just of parameters in isolation, parameter vectors in isolation, not just of the latent state of the system, but jointly the parameters and the latent state of the system um, in ways that are, 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 can be really eye-opening. So this is, is where we're going, but I, I want to provide some motivation for it. I mean. Um, um, I think of them from, from much of my work in this area, there's a real motivation um, around outbreak prediction and response. Um, uh, many of you know, I worked for 13 months um, in our, the heart of our health system. Um, and still day to day, I'm, I'm still involved in, in helping to advise on those efforts. Um, and, um, you know, many concerns around effective mobilization of health resources, surge capacity mobilization, hinge around outbreak detection and anticipation of where this is going. When we want to have surge teams for our ICUs or in emergency departments, um, when we want to um, put together uh, a scale up of contact tracing teams or for other infectious diseases, outbreak response immunization campaigns. Um, we do so because we have some sense that we're in a crisis or it's approaching and we need to respond to it. We need to rise to the occasion. Um, and, you know, regular reporting, whether it's daily or weekly, gives us some sense of where we're at in terms of observables, but it gives us often comparatively little quality in what lies ahead. You know, we may look at a, a counter and we may say, well, Looks like it's rising, but we're not sure for how long it will be rising. Or maybe it's kind of, um, you know, dipping around and we're not sure, is this an outbreak in the making or is this just we're finding cases we didn't find before and um, uh, just mopping up from some earlier, uh, earlier outbreaks. So the goal here um, for, for me in applying many of these methods in infectious disease is early detection and anticipating the trajectory of where cases are going to go in an emerging outbreak. And these techniques can be fantastic for that purpose, which is why I've invested years of my time in them. Um, at the same time, um, uh, all of us 
have probably realized in the context of the pandemic that outbreaks are often marked by really notable stochastics, that timing the evolution is, is stochastics. And you know, I noted early on with modeling projects, often we build the model um, and, and then, and we parameterize it, maybe we calibrate it, maybe we test it and, and evaluate it and find it wanting and refine it, but come up with a model we're happy with and then we use it for insight and we use it to give recommendations and we use it for projections. Um, and that's okay, but uh, for, for many of these techniques and many of our models, um, taking that model and, and sort of bringing it together with new data is often a fairly heavyweight manual process. We have to re-parameterize the model, recalibrate it. Um, sometimes we, we go and modify the model. Um, and the techniques we'll be talking about today are, are, and, and in the, is this module course are going to provide us with a better way, a way that these models will be constantly ingesting data, constantly consuming new data and making use of it to update their, their explanations. Um, so zeroing down a, a level here, um, I wanna offer you two reflections here. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna mention two problems, problem A and B. Um, um, problem A is the fact that look, we have to be, I'm, I'm a big advocate for what I like to call not just agile modeling, but humble modeling. Um, we have to recognize that models are always approximations, that, um, that are models, to use the words of George Box, this famous statistician, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, models are like maps, they, they are useful for certain purposes, but um, uh, you know, they can get outdated like maps can. And, and the truth is, however good our model, whatever pedigree it's with, however much care we poured into it and lavished upon it, even the most detailed models diverge from the empirical situation as time passes. Models are not crystal balls. More foundationally, they're learning tools. They're not crystal balls. And it is inevitable from uh, whether it's a rough and ready model or a highly refined, sophisticated model, it is inevitable. It is in the nature of things that it will diverge from what we see in the world. And there's many reasons for this. Um, there's omitted factors, there's approximations, there's changes in behaviors in the world about risk behaviors. There's new technologies like vaccines or like potent combination antivirals. Um, there's, uh, there's a whole suite of different regions and, uh, reasons that, that things come about. But there's also stochastics. We have things like Omicron coming in from left field. We have mutations going on within our jurisdictions and outside that inevitably bring um, surprises to our shores. Uh, we have stochastics in terms of whether an outbreak takes off or whether the, some of the key people are located by public health before it takes off. We have uh, a whole set of factors that that make this that make exact prediction a fool's game. And um, and and you know we can just say, well, we'll live with it. Um, we'll we'll recognize these limitations and live with it. And by and large, that's what modelers have done for for uh, decades. Um, and uh, the, with the work of Ross and, Mac, uh, and, and McDonald's uh, or Kermick and McKendrick in the early part of the 1900s for century, over a century. Um, uh, but divergence can strongly affect the perception of intervention trade-offs. So the fact that our model is no longer current, that it's gone off from the expected course, it's not just you know, something that we can just shrug and say, well, that's too bad. It's, it's the model, the model's recommendations may now be, be off base in their weighting. If our model is way off base in the number of susceptible people that are out there, its recommendations about the effectiveness of an outbreak response immunization campaign compared to faster contact tracing will be thrown off. Um, its understanding of the balance of gains 
from one intervention versus another of different levels of staffing of active case finding or of or of um, you know hospital screening or what have you will be thrown off the fact is if if we're not capturing the current situation in the model um, nearly well then uh, it's going to come out in terms of recommendations that place misplaced emphasis on one intervention versus another. And it's inevitable this happens. Um, here's a model um, for measles, um, a published model uh, out of the UK, which uh, my student Xiao Yan Li, as part of our master's thesis or eminent master's thesis, um, uh, RTA, um, calibrated to empirical data on measles uh, here from Saskatchewan. And um, she calibrated and you know she got a very nice calibration uh, out of this uh, to this data. Now this is she calibrated to this particular data looking forward and, and then um, but you've got to note that um, there's a lot of things that it's even this very calibrated model calibrated to this is is missing, right? You'll notice early on, wow, it's really getting, you know the peak timing and, and to a degree that continues but there there's this kind of increasing disconnect between what the model a calibrated model will show as likely to occur and what's actually occurring the vagaries of when these outbreaks occur and when there's a a, a period of, of quiescence here um this is over months you know of, of decades and you see you know gosh there's this um it's a really good model. It's a published model. It's an excellent model, um, excellent as a learning tool. But trying to trying to run it in you know uh, at time 150 say 150 months uh, or maybe we'd say 120. So it's it's uh, 10 years. Trying to use it to kind of understand what's likely to happen in the next little bit would be problematic. But more than that, I'm trying to use its understanding of the current state of things to to say what intervention would be better than whatever uh, than another would also be problematic because its state is probably so far off from, from what's observed. Um, what we'd like to have here is quickly formulated, you know, frequently regrounded models, models that are constantly kept current with the latest evidence that are, that are kept abreast of, of what's actually happened and kind of re, re synced up so um, maybe it's the same model, but we we look at what's actually transpired, and we account for that in the current model state. So we always have a model that's fresh, always regrounded, always able to look forward with the confidence that it's incorporated, you know, the latest evidence. Um, and uh, for more than a decade, I've I've been keen on you know avoiding this idea of open loop models. I want to bring models into the loop. Instead of having something like this, where we, we uh, are going to build a model, declare it worthy, and just start using it and just live with the fact that it's increasingly divergent. I want a model that every day is re-synced up with new data. I want it a bit like a weather app, right? Um, we may have the best weather app in the world, or we may have the best weather model in the world, um, uh, the world's greatest, most sophisticated, most uh, detailed, uh, what have you, um, weather model with the best understanding of meteorological dynamics. But if, if that weather model is calibrated to data from the beginning of February, um, and we're using it to decide whether or not we wanna drive from uh, between major cities in Saskatchewan uh, tomorrow, um, we're going to be in for a world of trouble because that weather model may be the best one in the world, but there's no way based on its knowledge, based on the data that was available in early February, that it's going to be able to know if there's a skiff coming tomorrow that's going to dump a lot of snow on that road and make it treacherous for driving. Instead, what we look to with weather models, of course, of course, is that they're always resynced with data. That every few hours it's synced up at the least, um, at least that frequency, um, and 
and then uh, it's not so much the weather model by itself that's the virtue, it's the weather model regrounded by evidence. If this weather model is again, the best in the world and it's been regrounded by evidence about what's actually happened in our province within the, within the past hour, I'll give it a lot of credence in deciding my travel decisions for tomorrow. So in a lot of areas of the world, whether it's weather or areas of uh, industrial modeling um, or, or spheres associated with, uh, um, with modeling of logistics, we, we look to our models to be kept current and abreast and constantly regrounded in data. This is the sphere of systems data science. It's not system science by itself. It's together with these data streams, this, this rich evidence. And, and yet we're looking, we're looking to have an understanding of the current situation that's valuable, um, but then we wanna be able to look forward. And these models um, need to be able to learn from evidence that is accumulated over time. They, they need to be able to to learn about plausible values of changing parameters or, or the underlying state of the model and then project forward from that. And this again is from Cheyenne's work with measles, with, uh, which was one of the two conditions she looked at for a master's both eminently. Um, and we wanna be able to look forward. So here's current time. We've seen all this evidence now and the model is kept right in line with that. It's not, just kind of getting increasingly disconnected and and you know uh, spaced out about the current situation. It's it's keeping in sync. Maybe the model didn't expect this peak, but the model makes a valiant effort to explain it and to clue itself into it and to say what's the implications of that for my understanding of the current situation. Uh, maybe it, it expected more cases here, but it got fewer and it's saying, okay, what is that telling me about the state of the system? But we've learned from all this data and now we wanna be able to say in light of that learning and the model structure, the theory captured in the model, what are we likely to see over the next little bit? What are we likely to see over the next few years? And as you can see, these are data points. These black ones are ones that hasn't taken into account. Those red ones are ones that it did take into account. These black ones are ones that it hasn't, but are shown here just to give uh, the ability to compare model predictions, knowing all the data only to this point against, against empirical data. And what we see it is in kind of a ghostly way, a whispered way, it is telling us, hey, there's probably a big outbreak coming. Um, over the next you know, two years is a good chance of an outbreak. Um, uh, this is probably over the next year here and out here there'll probably be a second one further on it's it's increasingly uncertain just like a, a weather app two weeks out four weeks out eight weeks out it's going to be increasingly uncertain and hey summer is warm it's going to say probably it's not you know you probably don't have uh snow on the ground in june um or in july uh, uh, but um, it's not going to be very certain day to day what's going to be going on. And, and that's in the nature of things. Um, so uh, Cheyenne's work, for example, examined this from a modeling perspective and found, yes, you actually can, with artful methods, predict um, what's, what's coming in the next year very, very, very well. Um, and even if you're in the middle of an outbreak, you can anticipate when it will turn around or, or where it will uh, head down and, and you know, how quickly, et cetera, uh, very, very well um, for diseases like measles and pertussis in the pre-vaccination era. Um, so this model is a model that's regrounded in this way. It's kind of like a GPS system. Now, some of you are, are so young that I don't know if you remember the world before ubiquity of GPSs, uh, but a few people on the call, um, uh, will remember this well. And, you know, we used to take uh, directions to our, our destination with us, um, print them out and take us with them. And whether we're riding the Metro or we're, we're in our car and, and we, we take these directions and we'd get in a world of trouble if we were driving to an unfamiliar city and we had the directions written out what streets to take and oh man, there's a street festival on that street or this one's closed due to construction. What am I gonna do? And you know, 
you have to plot your way around to try to figure out how am I going to get to my destination. Um, that's a little bit like we're working with a model that's getting increasingly off base and you know, we've got to evaluate policy choices and we know the model, the model is, it's a very good model. It's one of the world's best models for this disease, but it's, it's, it's not representing the current situation. And so our, our recommendations are gonna be really off. How do we get to that point we wanna to get to in terms of public health outcomes? We're increasingly unsure. It's like trying to navigate these streets that are, that are unexpectedly closed or what have you. Or we're trying to figure out in our head what does this mean and, and how is this going to affect our choices? Um, of course, the magic of a GPS is that you miss your exit or it's closed because of a street fair, because of weather, because of construction, and it's going to reroute you to your destination. It's always going to give you fresh estimates in light of, of those lost opportunities for how to get to where you want to get to, to the public health state in our case we want to get to. So it's going to be constantly re-estimating where we are right now. And in light of that, how we get to our destination, how we're going to arrive at that state we want to get to in light of where we are, not where we wanted to be or we thought we were going to be at this point. It's constantly re in, hey, the situation has changed. These are the best new recommendations. No, that's what our models are going to be able to do. Whether powered by common filtering by particle filtering or particle MCMC, that's the picture. They're constantly cluing in to a situation that's changed out from under us and where our early model predictions, as good as they were, aren't matching up with what we see on the ground. Okay, so common filtering is the most venerable of these approaches. Um, uh, formulated by uh, uh, Rudolf Kalman in 1960, and it's sometimes called Kalman Bucci filtering. But again, uh, Stratanovich and others contributed to the theory of this in the late 50s, um, um, a few years before. And really, what's happening here is, and I, I want to uh, thank uh, slides here for uh, Xiao Yan from her master's thesis and, and presentations from that. And my student um, Chen Wei Chang, um, uh, Winchell Chen, who um, whose um, doctoral work and, and published papers on common filtering, I'm using some of his slides uh, that he's kindly shared. Um, so this filter basically goes between uh, two phases, which are also held in common by these other techniques, particle filtering and particle MCMC. So you should get used to this idea of what's called a predictor corrector loop here. Um, so what, what's going to happen is we're going to have a system that's going to integrate forward, going to simulate forward. It doesn't have to be numerical integration. It doesn't have to be a, a numeric system in general for particle filtering and particle MCMC, but somehow it simulates forward um, when we have no new data that's available. And then when data is available, it takes this data and it it says, okay, you know, how are my expectations for what's going on now aligning with the empirical evidence? And what is that empirical evidence telling us? And it it balances both. It recognizes the model is fallible, and so is the data, and it, and and it pursues a balance between the two. Um, uh, Kalman pursued uh, this work in, in the early 1960s, um, and um, he was a towering figure in this area. Um, I'm proud to say he did some of it uh, at MIT, um, which was a hotbed of, of this sort of, um, sort of work, and indeed it's been incorporated in, in many systems uh, since then around society. The, the overall feel for this is that it is using, it is balancing between a model's uh, projections, this projection of what the model expects to be going on now, and what are called, in, to use technical parlance, measurements. I prefer to use the term empirical observations or observations. They're observations from the world. Um, uh, 
often common filtering is applied in you know aircraft avionic systems or or uh, applied in the context of um, spacecraft or or what have you and there it's a measurement of some sort from a sensor but it doesn't need to be it could be an empirical observation of cases of new illness um so um uh, here we have a um a, a set of measurements and uh and we have some state-based models some model that's projecting forward and we're going to blend them together and how we blend them is through this gain matrix k um that we'll be seeing um it's going to be the thing that balances these two take into account how noisy how 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 uncertain are the measurements versus how uncertain are the model estimates recognizing critically that the model estimates over time are getting more and more fuzzy they're getting more and more uncertain there's more and more uncertainty about what's likely to play out just like with our weather model you know we're getting more and more fuzzy the further time we go out one month two months three months what the likely situation is so this gain matrix is going to clue us in how much to trust the model versus how much to trust the measurements here it's going to be a matrix in the in the particle filtering context we're going to see this role played uh, by a different set of factors and a more general uh, set of factors okay um this is a recursive system um we're going to have estimates given at any one time and uh, those estimates we combined with measurements to get a kind of consensus estimate uh, a consensus sense of what the current situation is and um and that consensus system will uh will guide us um but then it will form the basis as we integrate it forward as we simulate it forward for um for our estimate uh, for our next time. Um, it will we'll then update that estimate as the system integrates forward, as it simulates forward, and we'll combine it with a new measurement. And we're constantly having the system evolve over time and new measurements come in. If this reminds you, ladies and gentlemen, of the hidden Markov models, it is with good reason, um, because that's very much the flavor there, right? We have these discrete states, here we have continuous states, there we had discrete states, and those states were evolving over time, and we had measurements whispering to us about what the current situation was, but we, we had that current situation changing out from us, and we're trying to understand what's, what's the current context. I want to emphasize, these techniques are filtering techniques. They are not that common filtering is not by itself a static parameter inference technique. The parameter values here are viewed as static um, and, and we're not estimating those. Um, if you have a modifying parameter, parameter of reporting rate or you know, number, a fraction of, of, uh, of uh, people who, uh, who need hospitalization or what have you, if you have something like that that could change over time, as we go from one variant to another or what have you, um, then uh, we would incorporate that as part of model state. Um, we consider it as part of the evolving state of the system. Um, so it's not that we can't look at them. We can, it's just we consider them as part of the state. And so it is with particle filtering as well. Um, things, parameters that are changing over time. In fact, particle MCMC we consider part of state. But particle filtering of common filtering are not state estimation techniques. Oh, sorry, they're, excuse me, take that back. <laughs> Wipe that from your consciousness. They're not, they're not techniques for estimating static parameters is what I meant to say. Um, okay, now all of this is with respect to a noisy system. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen, we gotta get used to it except the fact that these systems are stochastic. All you have to do is look at these time series. Um, look at COVID-19 time series. Um, uh, you'll see all sorts of indications of stochastics over time. Um, and these techniques only really make sense in the context of stochastic systems. 
So in this sphere, we're dealing with stochastic systems. Um, in contrast, like MCMC is typically applied for, for deterministic systems, systems without stochastics. Here we're embracing stochastics. We recognize there are stochastics. And in fact, um, those will be central to kind of the intuition of it and, the, and in fact, how we tune these models. Okay, um, so a few factoids about common filtering and, and um, as, as one of these techniques. The, the simulation model here um, includes stochastic processes, centrally. Um, they, they are part of its formulation. And part of that, it, the implications of that are, are profound, but one of them is we have to estimate the state of the system at any one time. It's not given by the parameters themselves. It's not like we give the parameters and we simulate the system forward from the start and we know the state of the system now. No, 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 it's stochastic. Um, with the same set of parameters, we could simulate it forward from the start and you know, by happenstance and chance through weather or, or changes in behavior or, or just the luck of the draw of the wrong person going to the nightclub at the wrong time. There's an outbreak early versus, a, you know, one that could have been kind of avoided or what have you. We, um, we need to estimate the current state now. We can't just, we can't just like an MCMC say the parameters at the beginning, you know, parameter values together with the initial state completely determine the state now. No, 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 no. We're, we're, we've got to estimate the current state. Um, yeah, we're not sure what the underlying state is, and we only observe little bits of it um, through our observations. Um, uh, another implication of the stochastic process is over time, as we run the system, it gets more and more uncertain about what state it's in. We have stochastics operating, and they're they're, you know, often dissipative. They, um, they, they make it more uncertain. Um, now, uh, within these, within the common filtering, um, what's going to happen is it's we're going to have the system run normally um, between observation points, and this is going to carry over for particle filtering and particle MCMC too between observation points for the simplest formulations of these systems, we just run it normally. Um, it's our familiar bread and butter simulation equations and we're running it forward. But at the observation points, that's when the action happens. And the action will happen in, in different ways for these different types of filters. For common filtering, we're, we're going to actually adjust the state estimate. We're going to actually say, oops, our maximum likelihood estimate of the state was off. We thought it was X. We thought it was this one, uh, this thing, and now it's actually that thing. Um, so we'll adjust our state estimate. Um, with particle filtering, any one particle doesn't change its state estimate. In particle filtering, the particles believe hard. They, they're gonna hold to their belief, no matter what, what we change is which particle we trust more, which is the one we trust. More. But with common filtering, we're honest to goodness changing our understanding. We're saying, oops, we misjudged. Um, I think, I thought it was gonna be this based on the model, but the data is telling me this other thing. I'm gonna assume it's somewhere in between here um, that I think is the most likely. Okay. Uh, the second thing I want to emphasize, which again holds for, for particle filtering, is it's performed recursively. It's performed in online way. What, what this means is when new data comes in, we don't have to reconsider all the old data. You know, with MCMC, if we had new data come in, we could rerun an MCMC process, and we need to consider all the data to this point. Calibration, we need to consider all the data to this point. We'd, we'd be re-estimating the parameters in light of all this data. The new data point would add to the end of that time series, say, new, a few new observations maybe at the end of the time series, and we need to rerun the, the model calibration against all the previous data. Here, it's, it's very different. Um, we have incremental data, and we have incremental computation. We, we 
we, we update our previous estimates with new estimates, with finesse. We, we say, oh, that was our estimate before. This new data has come in. Now we're going we're gonna to update that estimate. We don't have to reconsider all the earlier data. Um, and we just tweak our estimate, as it were. Or, or instead of tweak, maybe we frob it or we, we, uh, you know, we uh, twist it in some way. But it's, we're not having to get, reconsider all the earlier data. Um, now, Coleman filtering is, um, is a technique that estimates a maximum likelihood estimate. A single estimate is most likely and it has a covariance around it. It has that flavor of some of the calibration algorithms. We, we say, I think this is the case and I have some uncertainty around it. Um, and as we'll see, it comes uh, encumbered from with some assumptions about distributions. Common filtering is an amazingly efficient technique. It was running in the Apollo computers. Um, uh, and it's a reflection, it can run gosh, hundreds of thousands of times a second, probably you could do it. Would you have data spewing in from sensor readings um, many times a second, and it can just update, 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 update in a way that particle filtering could not. Particle filtering and particle MCMC, now those are techniques that are best, uh, that, are, that are really good fits when you have data coming in something like once a day or something like that. You, have, you don't have to do it many times a second. Common filtering can do many times a second. So when you're driving or, or walking, trying to find that restaurant or your friend's house based on uh, GPS, it's, it can be doing it many times a second and giving you new updates um, based on where it sees you going and the direction you're going and the measurements and where you, it figures out where you probably are, even though the measurements are noisy and its understanding of how fast you're walking is noisy. Um, it, it's really computationally frugal. Okay, um, so you know, if I had additional time, I'd probably first present the Kalman filtering, which is provably optimal filtering state estimation when we have uh, a, uh, a linear process with Gaussian noise, with, with normally distributed noise on measurements and on process noise. Um, uh, you, you can prove it's, it's the optimal technique. It's optimal filtering. Extended Kalman filtering is a twist on that. And it, there's kind of a nice progression between the two. And you'll find in my, my links here, um, at one or two places, a, a link to the talk, which will walk you through the whole sequence. But I want to talk about some of the assumptions, recognizing some of these are assumptions for Kalman filtering and some are specific extended Kalman filtering. So Kalman filtering um, in general and extended by, by extension um, assumes normal, normally distributed uh, noise affecting uh, both system evolution and separately measurement from the world. Um, uh, IID there is um, independent and identically distributed. We're, we're assuming system evolution is, is characterized by a certain level of, of, of uh, fixed noise um, that's growing uncertainty over time. And we're assuming when we measure something from the world that we also have normally distributed errors in our estimates. Um, um, now, those are foundational to common filtering, and there's a reason for that we'll get to in a moment. But beyond that, for extended common filtering, we depend on equations that govern state evolution. Um, you know, the, the things like minus beta times I over N, time, or C times I over N times beta times S. Um, um, those, those equations governing the evolution of our system, we assume they're linearizable and therefore they have to be differentiable. And same thing for governing observations um, uh, we, that relate observations to system state. If we, if we figure out what observation would we expect given a certain system state, that has to be a 
relationship that's linearizable. Um, this is important because particle filtering, particle MCMC, these are techniques that don't make these assumptions and could in principle be used for models which are not linearizable, like agent-based models. Um, but common filtering and, and, and particularly extended common filtering does assume linearizability. Now, you may wonder like, why are we kind of strangely privileging um, or elevating normally distributed things? Well, normal distributions are really, really, really nice. Um, just like exponential distributions are really nice. Um, and indeed, there's, uh, sorry, just like, just like exponential functions are really nice. Um, um, with, with normal distributions, it turns out that they're closed under addition and multiplication. So if you take two normal distributions and you multiply them, you get a multivariate normal distribution. Um, it, so if you have P of X and P of Y, the probability of, of observing a given value X and probability of giving, uh, observing Y, and you want to know the probability of observing a, a given vector X, Y, um, you, 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 and you, if they're independent, you multiply them, you get a normal distribution. If you add them, you get a normal distribution um, of P for P of X plus Y. Um, so, so that's really, really nice. Um, you got this homomorphism there um, that's beautiful. It turns out linear transformations of normal distributions are also normal. Um, you, so so if, if, if I transform something in a certain way, um, I, instead of doing P of X, I deal with P of alpha X plus B, um, or something like that, I'll, I'll get out a normal distribution. Um, also a P of X, Y, if that the joint distribution of X and Y, I consider as a telling me what values of X and Y are most likely as a vector, um, the marginals, um, P of X and P of Y, if I integrate out the other ones, they're normal. The conditional distributions are normal. It's normality all around the town. Um, you, you get this really nice normality. And it turns out that if you multiply a, you know, a matrix uh, times one of these nice distributions, it's a linear transformation. You get something out, it's normal. It's just beautiful. It's just beautiful. Um, so, so, so the extended common filter depends on this. The product and linear transformation of, of Gaussians. When I say Gaussian, that's the shape of the distribution. It's a normal distribution. Um, uh, and extended common filtering depends on a first order Taylor expansion using the Jacobian. Um, and there's many varieties of it. Now, before we go into this, I want to, I'm going to need to go over and, um, and remind us on matrices. And I see that it is the nature of the strictures of time. Where, where are my other, here they are. Um, uh, the strictures of time that I'm going to have to finish up this lecture on common filtering next time, because I'm going to lead you up to it. I, I want to remind us of some basics on, on matrices, okay? Um, so matrices, again, are, I, I feel, often um, not taught in a way that points to their intuitions. And again, I, I, I feel it's a tragedy um, of, of keenly felt proportions for me that many students take a linear algebra course and walk away without strong intuitions for, for the geometry and, and the, um, the meaning of, of matrices in a, in a, in a deeply ge geometric fashion. Um, and they, they lack intuition for, for matrices as operators. Um, uh, so we can view matrices in, in several different ways. And, and again, I'm hoping this will be, this will be a, a key asset for understanding um, common filtering, but also well beyond that. Um, if, you, if you come to understand these, you'll, you'll find it an incredible asset in many areas of, of technical mathematics, of, of mathematics. Um, so um, I'm gonna emphasize just a few of these. I'm not gonna go through these exhaustively. You'll find videos of me doing that in, in other spheres. But 
Um, there is one we've actually encountered before, and, and that's with the Jacobian. And you'll see it with, with the um, common filtering because taking the Jacobian as you know, um, the bread and butter of, of extended common filtering. You may remember if we have a system evolving like the SDT, so S dot equals some F of S. These are our equations, right? This is like, like C times I over N times beta times S, um, uh, et cetera. Uh, that is, you know, recovery of infectives minus I over mu or what have you. Um, these are our, our equations governing this, the evolution of the state S. And what I said in an earlier lecture, which perhaps you've blotted out from your memory, um, is that we can linearize a system like this, just like we can linearize a, a one-dimensional system you know, by drawing a line along it, we can, we can do so here in multiple dimensions. And really what we're doing is we're, we're taking a kind of a, a multi-dimensional thing. Here we have several dimensions of space like this parabola, and we are, we are getting sort of a plane that matches it. That's what's represented by this. It's, it's kind of representing a plane in a, in a higher dimensional space. Um, and this is a linear term, just like you know, this linear, uh, the linear plane, um, a flat plane. And, and these are some higher order terms. Now, this Jacobian is kind of governing in the area around this S, star, S question mark, um, the, this point, how the system kind of is evolving as we go away from that, you know, um, uh, how, how this F changes. And if we consider that Jacobian times some delta X, what we're really doing is we're gonna be taking a, 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 a column vector here. And I, I wanted to draw it out before this class, but I, I missed the time. So we're gonna have a, a column vector. And that column vector, um, if you consider multiplying by this matrix, this row is going to multiply by that column vector. So we're going to have like delta x times, times this, and delta y times the next term, and delta z times this term. And we're going to be summing them all up. And that's kind of telling us as we displace ourselves in delta x, delta y, delta z direction, how how this value of f is changing, this value of f is changing, how that, how quickly that, that's rising as we go out in, in a certain direction here. Um, and so it is, it will tell us how, for this first row, how the x component of this, the thing that's evolving x, the next one will be the y component, the next one will be the z component. That's what's kind of occurring here. We're saying, you know, how much does that function, that component of the function increase as we're going a certain distance in a direction? Um, and, and this thing represents how far we go in the direction by, by multiplying them together. It's kind of telling us, okay, how is F changing as we're going away from this? How is it changing in its first element as it relates to say, um, the S in an SIR model, how much is it going into its second, second row, and the I in an SIR model, and the third in R in an SIR model. Um, so just, just bear that in mind. When we have a Jacobian times a, a matrix, it's kind of telling us how much does this function rise or fall. We're going to be seeing Jacobians to the extent of common filter, so I wanted you to have that intuition um, for, for what this kind of means. It's, Telling us how does this rise or fall as we go away, you know, as we vary this S or the displacement from this. So that's one thing I want you to understand. Um, um, I think I'll go light on this one, but I, I wanted to emphasize this one. This one is actually going to be very important for, um, for understanding the common filter. Ladies and gentlemen, matrices are not boxes of numbers, just in isolation, they're operators. They, they, they operate on vectors. They, they take a vector and they map it to another vector. And specifically, they take a vector in, in the row space into a, a, an output vector in the column space of a, uh, as a, as a uh, of the matrix. So if we have a, 
we multiply matrix times x here, um, um, this vector, it's a column vector, can only have as many entries as there are columns of the, of the matrix, in other words, m. Um, and if we multiply by it, we'll get something out with one value for each row of A. In other words, we'll get something in R of N. So, so a matrix kind of takes a vector in R, R to the M, an M dimensional mat a vector, uh, mat or a vector in M dimensions, and it in, turns it into a vector in N dimensions for a, for a matrix is N by M. Um, and you know this is the, the vector that results from this mapping. So, this is an operator. It operates on the vectors and puts out new vectors. It takes the vector in, thank you very much, and it puts out a vector out as, as output. Um, we could kind of think of Y as the one corresponding to X. X has been mapped to Y by this. Um, uh, so, so that's rather, rather nice. Now, Y is in the column space of this. So it's 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 you know a combination of the columns. It's a sum of the columns according to the values of x. X is, and that's the one I didn't show you here. So x tells us how much of each column to put it, of a. How much of each column of a do I put into y? What's the recipe to create y? How much of each column of a am I putting in? That's what x is, um, and and it's getting something out in the in the columns. Okay, so that's. That's that's kind of nice. And one thing implication of that is if X is is just one of these type of vectors, just one of these, you can just read out what Y is. This one will pick out the last column of A, right? It'll, it'll be zero times the first column and zero times the second column, all the way down to one times the third column of A. It will pick out the third column of A. That's what this vector does. It says one serving of the third column of A, please. Um, and it will give it to you for Y. This one will pick out the second column of A, right? That's, that's how matrix multiplication works. If you think through the mechanics of it, multiplying like that, um, it's, it's just picking out the third, third column. Um, uh, okay, so, so matrices operate on things. They, 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 they extract columns and they they do other things like rotate things and, and so on. And so, and they squish them in certain ways, but in linear ways. Um, so when we have a matrix, um, we can actually read out what it's gonna do to things. You can actually learn to read these things out quite nicely. If I see a matrix like that, I say, oh, okay. Um, you know, it's going to uh, pick out, if I multiply it by a vector, it'll pick out the first um, uh, the first element there of of, of that uh, vector, and then it'll so so if I have this matrix and I multiply it by a vector, it will retain the first uh, uh, essentially this the l. So if I apply this to a given vector, it will uh, uh, it will pick it out there on that dimension, and this one will be scaled by a factor of two. That's where the two comes from here. It'll be taking, uh, taking out uh, that and scaling up the second component and just retaining the first component here. So uh, this shows kind of the, op the operation of a matrix on, on vectors, what it will do to a vector at different points here, how it will transform it. And you can see some of them are skewed, some of them are flipped, some of them are squished, um, some of them are rotated. Um, and, and it just takes that vector that's multiplied by that matrix and flips it around in different ways according to, to, these, uh, to these columns. Um, and you can learn to reason about this using the sort of reasoning shown here. Um, and if, for anyone who wants to, to experiment with this, I'd, I'd refer you to Wolfram Alpha. And you can get an intuition for what a matrix is telling you, what it's doing to things. And the point is, its entries are transforming things uh, in the row space into things in the in the column space. It the, a matrix is an operator. It takes things in one type of vector and it puts out things in another type of vector. That's the key 
thing to, to have in mind. It's a rather nice skill to be able to look at a matrix and know what it will do to vectors, um, how it's going to operate on them. It's a very nice skill. And if you spend more time with this, you can, you can develop this. Um, uh, OK, um, I think uh, I'll go light on this, but I want to use our remaining minutes to get back to our, our point at hand here. Um, there's plenty more for you in those slides, but I want to um, I want to come back to these uh, to the common filtering. So common filtering is going to use those intuitions about matrices. It's going to be full of matrices. And we're going to briefly introduce this, and then we'll come back and explain it in more detail next time. So it turns out that um, that it's going to be based on Taylor expansion. We're going to use a Jacobian matrix. Um, and we're going to eliminate um, uh, higher order terms. We're going to linearize, and the Jacobian comes out when you linearize. When you linearize, there's many varieties of the extended common filtering. If you go and you look up extended common filtering, you may be confused because there's several varieties of it, and those varieties are, are different based on two major attributes. Um, one whether or not time is continuous or not for the extended common filter. If time is continuous, then you have one set of methods. If time is discrete, you have another set. When I mean discrete, I mean we hop between times. For the case of epi models, for the case of infectious disease models, we're dealing with continuous time. We're dealing with system that has to be integrated. So we need the continuous time versions. But by and large, um, uh, the, well, the other attribute that these are distinguished by is, is whether or not they're discrete measurement times or continuous. For certain types of industrial and avionics needs and so on, essentially we have continuous measurement. We're constantly measuring from a sensor and adjusting our understanding of where we are and potentially firing thrusts on our, on our um, jet plane engines or whatever. What we're dealing with here instead is discrete time measurements. Maybe we have daily case counts. Maybe we have daily hospitalizations or deaths or what have you. And, and so what we want, and this is very important if you wanna look up references on it, is the continuous time discrete measurement form of the, com of the extended Coleman filter, um, where we have measurements in discrete time. Um, OK, so um, the, the formulation of these equations is actually rather terse and concise. But if you look at them, it's easy to get very confused. Um, they're filled with uh, these capital letters and lowercase letters and these hats. and and no hats and, and so on. And I, I wanna get you situated here. So uh, first of all, I'm gonna introduce, um, there's two key quantities we have to be aware of. Um, the things that are part of the state vector, and we'll assume there's N components of a state vector. So if we have an SIR model, we N is three. Um, if we have an SEIR model, N is four. Um, it's the number of state variables, the number of stocks, the number of compartments, however you want to put it, n. Then we're going to have a measurement vector. This is going to be a measurement that we engage in from the world. Um, um, so um, the measurement vector is, um, is what we measure from the world. So maybe every day we have number of cases and number of deaths. So we have a measurement vector of length two. Um, by contrast, maybe we have cases, hospital admissions, um, ICU admissions, hospital census, ICU census, and deaths. It's five. If we added to that wastewater, like we have in our uh, particle filtering and particle MCMC model, we have six. Um, uh, and uh, here we're going to um, uh, we're going to be denoting that with M, okay? Um, so 
uh, those are going to be quantities which you'll see a lot here in the subsequent parts of this table. So we're going to have an underlying model state, which we're going to denote as X. And I'm not being really careful about whether it's capital or lowercase. So X, OK? Um, that's the, the model state or quantities involving model state. X hat, I should have noted, these little hats, um, that indicates estimated model state. This is the true honest to goodness model state. This is the estimated model state, X hat. Um, in a, in a frequent convention you'll see. Um, and that's a, that's a vector in R to the N. In other words, it's a n-dimensional vector, S-I-R or S-E-I-R or what have you. Um, we'll note with measurement values, I'd like to make it Y, but the conventions here are so strongly established that I'll denote it for this lecture as, as Z. Z sub K. You'll notice it's sub K because the measurements are occurring at discrete times. K is an integer. Um, please don't make K non-integer in your thesis or something. Um, it's, it's K. It's like Z0, Z1, Z2, et cetera. And that's a measured value. And therefore, it's, it's, it's a vector in RM. Um, so deaths and cases, for example. Um, then we have these deterministic governing equations, F. That would be like C times I over N times beta times S, right? Um, uh, for the infections and minus I over mu. Um, that, that's all packed into F. F is a, is a vector, uh, F applied to things, that says how quickly do the different components, S, E, I, R of, of X dot, how are they, how quickly are they, they changing as I, as I change this? So it's a, it's a vector, okay. Um, and then we're gonna have a thing called P, which is gonna be the covariance. Remember I said common filtering, unlike particle filtering or particle MCMC, it, it has a single most likely MLE estimate, point estimate, X hat, and then it has a um, covariance around that. There's P, that's, there, that's the P here. And that's an N by N matrix. Um, it's a covariance matrix about how does the state covariance, so the diagonals are the variance, um, the uh, reflecting uncertainty in our state, and the off diagonal elements are the covariance, reflecting the fact that, you know, if we're off, if we're high in S, maybe it means we tend to be low in I. We have this uncertainty that's inverse, for example. Um, and then we'll have a measurement covariance, which is for those things we measure like cases and deaths. Um, and then we're gonna linearize some things. So we're gonna have linearization of this F and that's gonna be capital F. And, then, and that's a matrix. Uh, it's, a, it's a Jacobian. It's that Jacobian you saw, okay. Um, and this is a linearization of the measurement equations. The measurements say, equations say, um, oh, it's not here, oh, man, it should be. Um, if we have a given state, what measurement do we expect for that state? What observation? So if we have a certain state of the system, S-E-I-R, how many cases and how many deaths do we, do we expect? For that state, how many would we expect to see? Um, and that should remind you of PMCMC a bit. Uh, given a state, we could say, how many, if I'm in this state, how many deaths and how many cases do I expect to see? So it maps from, from um, the state to the observation world or the measurement world. So that's, that's what H is. And H is a function in general. Maybe it involves some nonlinear components, this divided by the sum of those two things or what have you. And we have a linearization of it, which is capital H here. That's capital H right there. Okay. So that's a Jacobian of this, as we consider how it changes with respect to the state X. Okay, so um, I know your, your mind is, is probably spinning, but it, it turns out that, um, that this will work in a rather nice way. Um, and I should credit the images to this wonderful book by Gelb, which lays this all out in, in one of their chapters. Um, uh, okay, so, Basically, what's, 
we have a certain model of how this system behaves conceptually. The system behaves, it evolves according to standard state equations, standard, standard nonlinear differential equations, um, ODEs, plus some noise term. And this is assumed to be normally distributed. This is this so-called white noise. It's, it's, it's going up and down and, and with the value up or down being drawn from a normal distribution at any time. It's sort of this, this noise that's, that's occurring here. Um, in other words, our governing equations here are not quite right. And we get perturbations from them that mean it, uh, it's up or down. Here, for, for, our, uh, uh, for our observations in terms of uh, our, our measurements, um, we are saying um, here for a given measurement time, um, what we're going to measure is the state at that time. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, remember H maps from state to measurement. Uh, to observation. This is like the observation we expect from the state. So this is our state SEIR, and this is how many deaths and cases we expect, because those are our observations. And then we add to it some measurement noise. Some we're we're off. Our measurements are off. They're inaccurate. They're, you know, some cases are not reported, and some reported things are not actually COVID-19, but you know bad case of the flu or whatever. Um, um, so uh, here we have, this is the conceptual model of what's going on. We, we have some state, we make our observations from the state, but they're disturbed by some normal, normally distributed error. And we have the system evolving per ODEs with some white noise that's sort of knocking it up and down in a, in a kind of way that these equations don't capture stochastically. So it's stochastic. So that's our conceptual model. Now, the actual operation, the common filter, I know it, it looks like a buzzing, blooming confusion down here, but that's what this, this thing is. And you'll find that basically there's two components to it. I said it earlier. There's the prediction step and there's the correction step. You may remember that, I, I showed it here. So we're gonna predict forward, we're gonna integrate forward, and then we're gonna see to measurements, we're gonna say, uh-oh, we're kind of off. I predicted an outbreak now, but I'm not seeing it. Time to adjust my assumptions about the model state. Maybe there are fewer infectives out there than I thought, and, and fewer, maybe there's fewer susceptibles and more recoveries. So we do a correction. We say, oh, oh, okay, um, uh, I stand corrected. I'm, I'm gonna update my estimate. That's what's going on here. This is actually the measurement update. When I, when I measure something, how much do I update? And there's gonna be a beautiful intuition with this. It's just gorgeous. Um, I'll post these slides right after class, but you'll see that um, that uh, K here is operating in a way that basically is reflecting the trust we put in the measurements versus the trust we put in the, um, uh, in the, uh, the, the simulation itself, the, the model. Um, and uh, K is gonna balance that. If we totally trust the model, um, basically K will be zero and what we see after the, op the measurement is the same. We just throw away the measurement. We say that measurement isn't worth a hill of beans and we throw it away. Um, and in the process, covariance is also not, uh, this will go to zero and basically it's unaffected by the measurement. By contrast, if, 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 what, if we trust our measurement much more than the model, if we haven't seen a, a, a previous uh, measurement from the world, an observation for, for ages, um, uh, then we are, and we're really uncertain, then we're gonna trust that a lot more. And we're gonna give a big emphasis on correcting our model in a way that will bring it in line with the measurement. And that's what this term will do. This is the difference between the, oh, um, 
So uh, between what the measurement is telling us and what we expected would be, we would measure. And if we have a big discrepancy here, it will lead us to trust the measurement uh, basically. And we'll use that as our new state estimate. We'll say, okay, I must have been totally out to lunch. This is what the data is telling us. I'm going to go with that and give a state estimate that's as close as possible to giving that. Now, between measurements, it's, it's kind of normal operation. We just simulate forward our state equations. We just simulate for our ODEs. They just operate and we're updating our maximum likelihood estimate. It's only when we see an observation that that's corrected. Um, and our process error grows according to these terms. This is the noise component of it. And then this is the result of some linearization. But um, basically it's, it's going to grow over time and it's gonna grow faster if there's already a lot of uncertainty um, and if uh, the system tends to magnify uncertainty. Um, so, uh, so here um, we have some, some regularities and if you piece this apart, you'll find some of the, um, um, some of the thinking behind here. Um, we're gonna go through next time uh, why these equations make so much sense. Uh, and what's going on here. Um, you'll see that uh, there's uh, a, a very nice intuition in extreme cases uh, for, uh, for what happens at each of these places. When our, un when our observations are perfect accuracy and we can trust them entirely versus when they are of uh, very poor accuracy compared to our model and we don't trust them at all, how we, how we update things. So, so this is the common filter equation. This is what runs on, on your phones or what runs on avionics systems when we have a, a nonlinear evolution of the situation like we do with um, infectious disease models. So we'll come back and give an intuition for this and why these are not merely puzzling sets of equations but why they make so much sense um, and why they behave so reasonably under extreme cases. And when we're under sort of more normal cases, why they give a good balance between trusting the model versus trusting, uh, trusting, sorry, my, uh, my food is being filtered here. Um, trusting the model versus when we're trusting um, the, uh, the observations from the world. Um, but if all of this is Greek to you, please try to carry away from this lecture, this initial part, this idea that what we're doing here is different from parameter estimates. We're not seeking to estimate parameters here. We're seeking to understand the state of the system because the state of the system matters in terms of intervention trade-off and in terms of projecting forward. Just like that weather app, we're seeking it to be regrounded with the latest estimates. So when it tells us the weather tomorrow, we know that it's, it's um, going to be dependable um, because it knows what the weather today is. That's exactly what we're doing. We're updating our understanding of the situation now so we can project forward and we can ask, get reliable answers to questions about intervention trade-offs. Um, common filtering is one way to do it. That's very economically, uh, in term, very economical in terms of uh, uh, the um, uh, the computation involved. But we'll be seeing generalization. Sorry, my food is disappearing quickly here. Um, uh, well. We'll be seeing a generalization of it for particle filtering and particle MCMC um, in a little bit. Okay, so um, I'm going to uh, break now. Um, I'm going to have to go uh, round up the thieves here and salvage what what I can of my food, and I'll be back in five or ten minutes to uh, to open office hours uh, for. Um, for discussion on this or other matters. So thank you very much.